Hello and thanks for joining us. From Clint Eastwood's movie about a real-life foiled terrorist attack in France to the new film from the creators of Wallace and Gromit. Welcome to Encore's weekly film show. And we're joined in the studio by our film critic, Lisa Nesselson. Hello, Lisa. How are you? Now, we're starting with Clint Eastwood's film, The 1517 to Paris. It's the true story of how three young Americans foiled a real-life terrorist attack on a train in France in 2015. And the director asked the real-life heroes to play themselves in the movie, didn't he? Indeed, he did. And I think we can say that that may have been a better idea in theory than in execution. <laughs> uh, the problem with the film, which is also what makes it sort of an art movie, but, but not an exciting one, is that these guys are just so darn ordinary. They're really not terribly interesting, and they're playing themselves. So what makes them remarkable is that they did something remarkable. When I get on a train, I just hope I won't get motion sickness in the that no one will steal my luggage. Uh, I certainly don't assume I'll be called upon to save the lives of about 500 passengers because the terrorist who boarded that train and got suited up in the restroom where some other passengers thought uh, he was taking a long time went to find out about it and uh, got shot for their trouble. Um, they, um, uh, they, he had, I think, 300 rounds of ammunition, so it would have been a massacre. And uh, these, these good friends who were brave young men in top physical condition. Uh, they boarded the title train on August 21st, 2015 in Amsterdam, and of course had no idea they would be called upon to neutralize a terrorist. The screen is awash in masculine energy, I have to say, but the script was written by a woman, adapted from the book that all of them wrote together, the 1517 to Paris, the true story of a terrorist, a train, and three American heroes. Their names are Spencer Stone and Anthony Sadler. They left Berlin to meet up with their buddy Alex Scarlatos in Amsterdam, and then the Three, fat, three fast friends boarded the uh, potentially fatal train. Here's a moment when Spencer runs into another passenger. That moment in the film definitely looks exciting. <laughs> um, Clint Eastwood loves real life stories, doesn't he? Uh, he does, especially the last two he's made, which were both outstanding. He made the wildly successful American Sniper, starring Bradley Cooper as elite marksman Chris Kyle, and then Sully, in which Tom Hanks played Sully Sullenberger, a career pilot who managed to land an airplane full of people uh, on the surface of the Hudson River. Uh, now, these were stories of men with specific skills called upon to surpass themselves to help help others. And so is this. But those movies used the very best professional actors. Uh, the 317 to Paris rounds out the trilogy. But here, since the guys are playing themselves, and since, like I said, there, there's no other way to put it, they are not exceptional until they're called upon to be exceptional, exceptional. And that doesn't necessarily make for an exciting experience in the cinema. That said, I did have tears streaming down my face by the end, because what they did is inherently moving. But the way Eastwood has depicted it in close quarters, um, not, not so much. Maybe what he's trying to say is any of us could be a hero, even ordinary people. Now, something very different. The makers of Wallace <laughs> and Gromit are back with a new feature film. It's called Early Man. It's directed by Nick Park. You're probably going to tell me that it's not just for kids. <laughs> you know me too well. This is an absolutely adorable tale of the Stone Age versus the Bronze Age. Now, the Stone Age is what my country, the USA, reverted to on, oh, about November 8th, um, 2016. It is also, according to this absolutely wonderful comedy, the era in human history when the so-called beautiful game 
football to you, soccer to me, was first played. Now, football and cavemen, why didn't anybody think of this earlier? A caveman named Doug, voiced by Eddie Redmayne, has ambitions to hunt something larger than rabbits, but uh, perhaps a woolly mammoth there in the vicinity, but the tribe's leader holds him back. So the film shows us the gripes with management and politicians go way, way back. When imperious, allegedly more advanced invaders from the Bronze Age invade, the prehistoric stage is set for a showdown that's spoof sports and sports commentary, but shows how women can pave the way for progress. Let's take a look. <clears throat> Hello? Hello? How do you use this message bird thing? It's the queen. Just speak into its ear, ma'am. It will mimic everything it hears. I, mean, I don't even know if I'm holding it that... Testing? <coughs> Testing. <coughs> North? North? Perhaps she's heard about the game. Of course she hasn't heard about the game. I've heard about the game. <gasps> you. Now, Everyman is directed by Nick Park, and you recently interviewed him. It is so wonderful to get to meet one of your heroes and have them turn out to be just a really nice bloke, you know? Nick Park is the creative genius behind Wallace and Gromit. He also directed Chicken Run, and this movie is just enormous fun. I could not care less about football. Truly, I couldn't, but I chuckled a lot watching this. And there's a wonderfully silly tone to the proceeding, sort of as if there were an animated clay branch of the Monty Python troupe, but uh, unfailingly wholesome. So it really, really is a movie for the whole entire family. And uh, speaking of family, here's uh, how Nick Park uh, ended up being an animator. I, I remember one art teacher saying, that's not proper art. And uh, I, I guess part of me was, has always been defiant against that. And um, in fact, I didn't think it was proper art myself, to be honest, for many years. Uh, I used to do animation as a kid, like as a hobby when I was at school. And, um, and I guess it's, my, you know, my parents said, well, you know, they saw that I was doing animation and, and they loved it. And they said, why don't you think of it as a career? Here we go, Nick Park talking about his film, Early Man. Now, France's equivalent to the Golden Globes, the Lumière, um, took place this week in Paris. It's where foreign journalists vote for their favourite French films of the previous year. Now, you are the president of the Lumière Academy, and we're very honoured to have you here in the studio with us. Um, one film came out on top this year. Indeed it did. Uh, Beats Per Minute, the uh, story told by people who lived through it themselves of the ACT-UP years here in Paris, trying to get the government to take uh, HIV-positive and AIDS uh, people seriously. Um, it won in six categories, including Best Film. Um, Agnes Varda, without her uh, companion uh, JR, with whom she made the wonderful uh, documentary um, Faces places uh, was there to accept and JR at exactly the same time was in Los Angeles at the luncheon that they do for everyone who's uh, who's nominated for an Oscar and she sent a cardboard cutout of herself to take her place and uh, she made a choice to be here with us so that was wonderful we were uh, we had two people we did tributes to the wonderful Italian actress incredibly versatile uh, Monica Bellucci and also to the extraordinarily talented and charming 84 year old uh, French living legend Jean-Paul Belmondo. Jean, did I just say Jean-Paul? Jean-Paul <laughs> Belmondo. <laughs> And uh, for some reason, uh, the members of the board decided that I should have the honor of giving him his trophy. And uh, I actually haven't seen this clip of myself. Um, there was some, I, I wanted to be a little original. So, uh, Sound like you. <laughs> Let's take a look at yours truly and the great Jean-Paul Belmondo. Le cinéma, il est plus riche parce que nos votre niche, plaisir absolu, n'est jamais, mais jamais révolu. Les films dans lesquels vous faites votre bébé sont un plaisir absolu, plaisir absolu pour moi. Donc je vous dis un grand merci, regardons ceci. Merci beaucoup. They'd certainly never seen the like of it before, <laughs> I think. Now, um, we're going to end with a re-release in France of a 1981 film that took 10 years to make. Um, it's been billed as the most dangerous film ever made. It's called Raw. Tell us more. 
Ah, well, Making Roar involved the whole family of the director, Noel Marshall, whose wife was Tippi Hedren, now the only actress ever to have worked with both Charlie Chaplin and Alfred Hitchcock, and who co-starred in and produced Roar, one of the most peculiar films ever made. Now, Hedren had been acting on and off for 50 years, but her true passion is rescuing and protecting large cats, lions, things like that, which she does on the wildlife preserve Shambhala, run by her foundation in Southern California. Marshall had been a producer on the film The Exorcist, and he thought he would take the profits from that and put them into making a movie about large cats with the entire family, his two sons, and with Tip, uh, Tippi Hedren's daughter, Melanie Griffith, who at one point uh, almost gets eaten by a lion for real. The thing about this movie is there are no special effects. Everything you see is really happening. If people are bleeding, if people need stitches, the director of photography got his, his scalp half torn off and needed two stitches. He went on to direct the film uh, Speed. But anyway, if Melanie Griffith had been eaten by a lion, then we wouldn't have her daughter, Dakota Johnson, who uh, this week is all over the world, uh, starting here in France with uh, with the last installment in the Fifty Shades of What Have You uh, <laughs> a trilogy. This is not a particularly good film, but what's on the screen is consistently mind-boggling. Well, Lisa, thank you. We're going to leave it there, and we're going to leave you with Raw. Remember our website. We're also on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. There's more news coming up on France 24 after this. We are in Eden, though we walk to stay, almost looked away. See the shadow of the eagle in the sunrise, hear the music of the children in the moonrise, feel the power of the lion when he roars like thunder. Cats. The cat's got a little excitement. Yeah, that's all. Oh. This is my land.